I'd like to welcome you to What You Should Know About Bladder Cancer Risks and Prevention. This is a patient insight webinar from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. We'd like to thank Bristol Myers Squibb, the EMD Serrano Pfizer Partnership, Faring, Genentech, PhotoCure, and Merck for their support of the Patient Insight webinar series. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research at Beacon. I'm joined today by urologist Jonathan Wright. Welcome, Dr. Wright. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Stephanie, thanks so much for having me here. Great. Let me first give you a little background about Dr. Wright. He's an associate professor of urology at the Was University of Washington and the medical director of the University of Washington Medical Center Urology Urologic Clinic. He's an associate member in epidemiology at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and holds the Paul Lang Endowed professor Professorship in Urologic Oncology. Dr. Wright is also a member of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Bladder Cancer Clinical Guidelines Committee. As a specialist in urologic oncology, he's involved in several clinical trials and biomarker studies aimed at improving outcomes in patients with bladder cancer, as well in, as well as conducting epidemiological studies of bladder cancer. Dr. Wright led the development of the Bladder Cancer Rapid Autopsy Program at the University of Washington, as well as establishing the UW Bladder Cancer Multidisciplinary Specialty Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Wright. It's nice to have you here. Thank you so much. Great to be here, especially starting off May with Bladder Cancer Awareness Month and gearing up for our walk here in Seattle. Yes, yeah, so we're looking forward to that. And yes, this is a wonderful way to kick off Bladder Cancer Awareness Month. I'm going to well, turn it over to you, so you should be able to advance the slides. Sounds great. So uh, I first just want to go over a little bit of the background numbers for bladder cancer. Many of you may be aware of some of these. Uh, identify some of the established risk factors that we have for bladder cancer, and then try to uh, go through and identify some of the studies and some of the work that's been done thus far for looking at prevention of bladder cancer. And I've also included a small bit about uh, where we stand with screening for bladder cancer. So to start, this is a nice map that shows and reminds us that bladder cancer is a global disease. This map of the, of, of, of the, of the entire globe is color coded for how uh, the incidence, so how common bladder cancer is in different parts of the world. Darker blue being those having the highest incidence of bladder cancer, and as it gets more and more lighter blue, a lower incidence of bladder cancer. And you can see that the, the North America uh, in the dark blue has one of the highest incidence. A lot of Western Europe does as well, but there certainly are some other areas across the globe, little pockets where there's higher incidence of the bladder cancer as well. But uh, you can see every, everywhere across the globe, bladder cancer has an impact. And of course, it affects both men and women. Now here in the United States, bladder cancer is the sixth most common cancer diagnosed overall. It's number four for men and about number 11 for women. Over 80,000 new cancers will be diagnosed in this year. And it's the 10th most common cause of cancer-related death in the United States. And unfortunately, it is estimated to have over 17,000 individuals die from bladder cancer this year. Now, bladder cancer is more common in those who are older. The average age for diagnosis is 73, and 90% of patients are over the age of 55 at diagnosis, but there are still 10% that are younger than 55. And, and I certainly have many patients, both men and women, who are much younger than 55 with bladder cancer. So although it is commonly thought of as a cancer that affects older patients, it does affect those of all ages as well. This is a map just of the United States looking at the varying incidents, how common it is from state to state. Again, the darker colors are, have a higher incidence of bladder cancer and the lighter reds have a uh, lower incidence of bladder cancer. And there's one state that didn't have any data, hence the blue color. I look at this and it makes me 
actually think of questions rather than just looking at it, at it as for out of interest, because it is, it is quite striking that the more northern states appear to have a higher incidence of bladder cancer than the southern states. And as a, uh, as a uh, clinician and researcher and epidemiologist, this makes me think, well, what is it about the northern states? What is it about the exposures potentially uh, that are leading to this? And uh, since I first saw this slide, uh, just a couple months ago, it's made me think and, and I try to identify ways that I could go and study to understand. Uh, because again, this could help us with targeted targeted uh, um, education, targeted screening and trying to understand what's the exposure, what's going on here as opposed to here. But again, every state has bladder cancer. It certainly is more common in, in, in men than women, but as I said, it, it affects both genders. It's about four to one. This is how many, this is how many individuals per 100,000 uh, individuals. So about four to one uh, more common in males to females, but again, it affects both. When we look at ethnicity, we also see that there are differences with nearly double the incidence in non-Hispanic whites compared to non-Hispanic blacks, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Hispanics as well. The lowest incidence of bladder cancer by ethnicity is seen in the Asian and Pacific Islanders. And when we think about health disparities, it's interesting to look at these data to try and understand, you know, again, what is the exposure and making sure that people have access to care, even if their incidence is lower as well. So when we look specifically at risk factors, the number one risk factor is smoking. Approximately half of all bladder cancer deaths are thought to be due to, to tobacco use, and certainly about half of all bladder cancer incidents are thought to be due to tobacco use. Those current smokers have a 200 to 400 percent increased risk, or a two to four fold increased risk of bladder cancer compared to non smokers. Secondhand smoke, although not as strong, certainly increases the risk to people. And even for those that stop, and certainly stopping is absolutely advocated for and encouraged, there still is an increased risk of bladder cancer even up to 30 years out. Whereas for lung cancer, after 20 plus years, the risk approaches someone that, uh, that was a lifelong non-smoker. For some reason, this increased risk in bladder cancer persists even up to 30 years after uh, stopping smoking. We specifically here uh, in our group looked at this. This was a paper that we had done. Emily White was the, the lead PhD uh, on this study. And we, and we saw the same thing that yes, as you went from say less than 10 years, 15 years, 20 years uh, from when you quit smoking, there still was a statistically significant increased risk. Uh, and again, the highest risk was in those that are active smokers. The second most common group of risk for bladder cancer is, is occupational or uh, other exposures. Now this is thought to account for up to 20% of bladder cancers. Chemicals that we associate with it are benzene, aniline dyes, polycitric hydrocarbons. And most people don't know they've been exposed to those specific items when we see them and ask about their exposures. But these are things that are exposed in the paint industry, rubber, uh, leather, textile workers, in the cement industry, uh, electrical workers, workers and metal workers, miners additionally are, have an, are, are thought to have an increased risk of bladder cancer from their occupational exposures. Those that are, do a lot of work dyeing hair uh, uh, because of having the hands in the chemicals have an increased risk as well. Now, an individual who dyes their hair is not going to be at increased risk. This is someone who is exposing, exposed you know, day in, day out, year in, year out, uh, long-term exposure in the in the workplace uh, to hair dyes. Diesel exhaust, another, another aspect of, of risk. And firefighters, and I put a question mark as we, there have been some mixed studies about this, but uh, given all that they are exposed to, too, uh, with the carcinogens when things are, when, when there's a fire, uh, are felt to be at, at higher risk as well. And there have been some targeted screening studies looking at, at firefighters, uh, but to date have not yet uh, been shown to be beneficial. But again, a lot of us, up to one in five bladder cancers that we are seeing 
are, could be traced to some sort of occupational or, or, or chemical exposure. And as, our, as the rate of smoking is declining in our country, we're still seeing a pretty stable incidence of bladder cancer, and so there may be more of these other uh, etiologies or risk factors that are bringing out the bladder cancer that we're seeing. Arsenic uh, contaminates our water supplies, um, and it is known to increase the risk of bladder cancer. There have been a couple of nice, uh, what they call ecologic studies in, in a couple of areas, one in uh, Taiwan and one down in Chile, where the water supply got contaminated with arsenic, and they saw a significant increase in bladder cancer and also lung cancer, and then when it got cleaned up, the rates dropped down. The map that I'm showing here uh, is looking at the levels of arsenic across the country in private domestic wells, so well water, um, with, with darker the darker colors having a higher level of arsenic in them. And certainly the recommendations are to have it to be less than 50, parts, uh, 50 micrograms per liter. Uh, so there are certainly areas here where high levels of arsenic in the water could be leading to bladder cancer. Now, thinking back to that other map that just looked at, at uh, the overall incidence, north versus south, you can see arsenic is not explaining all of those differences. But, you know, there certainly are a lot of darker colors up here, and, and where I live here, uh, there are some dark areas, very dark areas as well. And one of the projects I'm working on is identifying our state well water uh, arsenic levels and trying to overlay that with where we're what what uh, zip codes we see bladder cancer incidence in to see if potentially we could go out and do a uh, 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 targeted education or cleanup to try to in, in improve the water supply which could then lead to lower incidence of bladder cancer so again it's pretty fascinating some of these things that are available uh, and how can we use them to help us reduce our cancers? There are certainly other risk factors. Those that have recurrent UTIs or urinary tract infections, the thought being it turns on the, there is an inflammatory aspect of cancer development. Um, and similarly, those that have chronic catheterizations, spinal cord injuries, or neurogenic bladders, uh, again, likely through an infectious inflammatory uh, pathway. Uh, and in some cases, uh, these more commonly have a different histology uh, with more squamous cell carcinomas as opposed to urothelial cell carcinomas and areas where, where there's a lot of talk about should there be targeted screening and surveillance of individuals and there's the, there's debate upon that on that issue bladder augmentation this is a unique uh, scenario when someone has a small contracted bladder that doesn't work very well more common in children um, uh, with myelomeningocele where the bladder, a piece of intestine is patched onto the top of the bladder to try to increase the capacity to lower the pressures in the bladder uh, and improve uh, incontinence and protect the kidneys. There, has, there was quite a bit of interest in doing gastrocystoplasties or stomach augments to the bladder, and we've been seeing more and more of, of, of these coming back uh, with cancer. And in these augmented, again, it's often a different histology uh, being an adenocarcinoma commonly as opposed to a urothelial carcinoma. Uh, so certainly another group where the exposure is the contact of the, of the intestine with it uh, versus uh, one of the other etiologies. And then pelvic radiation. We have lots of people that get radiation for prostate cancer. Rectal cancer is treated commonly with, with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. Cervical cancer gets radiation as well. And although the risk of radiation-induced cancer is very low, uh, a lot of people getting treated, and then we see these 20, 30 years after the radiation. And in my practice, where, pe where we're seeing people living longer and longer, which is outstanding, but I'm seeing these patients come in in their late 80s with radiation-induced bladder cancer. Um, uh, and so certainly that is a risk, but again, uh, the risk of radiation-induced cancers is quite low, but it is not zero. And then there are a couple of medications that can lead to bladder cancer as well. Cyclophosphamide is a specific type of chemotherapy uh, that is used uh, that uh, can 
lead to bladder cancer again a uh, decade later. Uh, finacetin is a pain medication. It's no longer on the market in the United States, uh, but uh, it had been associated with, uh, with bladder cancer, with urothelial carcinoma, and I have a, a few patients that had significant exposures to that in their past. And then Actos is a diabetes medication, which has, uh, has had some reports of leading to an increased risk of bladder cancer as well. Uh, so, so even just some of the medications that we are taking can put us at risk for bladder cancer. And then genetics, certainly the, uh, we're learning more and more about genetics of not just cancers, but lots of other diseases. And there is a heritable uh, aspect to bladder cancer, but is not as strong as some of the other cancers that we deal with, breast cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. Um, most, are, most bladder cancers are thought to be due to mutations in the bladder tissue itself, that make a mistake happens in the bladder tissue that becomes tumor, as opposed to an inherited mutation uh, that we're born with. But there does appear to be a small increase in risk, especially in families where bladder cancer is seen in other members of the family at a younger age, uh, less than 50, less than 60 for example. And then there are a couple of syndromes. I think the most common one uh, is Lynch syndrome, hereditary, also known, with hered known as hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. Uh, this is a DNA repair gene mutation, and patients with Lynch syndrome are at risk for a number of different malignancies, the most common being colon cancer, but they're also at risk for bladder cancer and what we call upper tract cancer in the, in the lining in the renal pelvis and the ureters. And there's quite a bit of uh, focus on doing some screening and surveillance for these individuals. And then there are some other rare inherited mutations uh, that can be passed through family, but these are quite rare, uh, uh, rare diseases. Cowden's disease, people that have retinoblastoma and then other mutations. Again, quite rare, but they are there. <clears throat> 